It, the chambers of power. An interesting comment in John Morgan's study of certain aspects of Puritan life and thought concerns their emphasis, quote, Much of the Puritan attempts at reform, perhaps especially in Elizabethan times, concentrated on the chambers of power. But even from the beginning of our period, Puritans were also keen to proselytize at the lowest organizational levels, hence a new interest arose in the possibility of the household as a center of godly instruction. At the bottom of all social analysis came the family rather than the individual. End quote. The enduring power of Puritanism came as it recognized that the chambers of power are not the same in reality as those seen by the world as the seats of dominion and authority. One of the major current problems is our failure to recognize the chambers of power which are readily available to all of us. The historian Ernst Breisach, in his excellent study of Historiography Ancient, Medieval and Modern, 1983, notes with respect to the future as Jacob Burkhardt saw it, quote, As ever, new attempts would have to be made to achieve equality among people who by nature were unequal. Traditions, laws and values would be destroyed as roadblocks on the way to absolute equality until finally social stability would disappear. In order to restore that stability and achieve ultimate equality, people would call upon socialism with its ever-increasing regimentation and centralization. This was a perfect situation for the emergence of despots, the terrible simplifiers, who offered order without true legitimacy and tradition. In such a new society, tradition, and with it history, would be replaced as society's guides by fickle public opinion, and quickly changing fashions of thought, end quote. We are in that, quote, future, end quote, now. Men are working to replace Christianity with humanism in every sphere of life and thought. Whatever the cost, man's will must be done. The West, long governed by God's law, is now under man's law. As early as 1924 in the United States, one of the most eminent legal scholars in surveying the work begun in the second half of the 19th century declared, quote, Thus, the cycle is complete. We are back to the state as the unchallengeable authority behind legal precepts. The state takes the place of Jehovah, handing the tablets of the law to Moses. End quote. Quote, the state takes the place of Jehovah, End quote. This is the proud boast of a major legal authority. The Chronicles of Livonia in the second quarter of the 13th century tells us of the people's desire to rid themselves of Christianity. They sought to reverse their baptism by bathing in the Dvina River, to remove their baptism by a water ritual and to send their baptism back into Germany. In the 20th century, men have sought by the mass murder of Christians to reverse history and re-establish pagan man. In fact, Eugen Rosenstock, who see in Out of Revolution, Autobiography of Western Man, 1938, sees Western history as for some centuries now a revolt against the supernatural man, Jesus Christ, and an effort to re-establish natural man, an Adam in Rousseau's image. We are thus in a war a war against Christ, and the enemy proudly claims all the chambers of power. How are we to survive this assault, let alone regain freedom and power? But there are other questions as well. The enemy holds all the established chambers of power, but is still failing. The world lurches from crisis to crisis, and men's hearts fail them for fear. Are these chambers now not in themselves chambers of impotence and petty tyranny rather than true authority and power? The bankruptcy of humanistic statism confronts us on all sides. One American state senator described to me a few years ago the growing fearfulness of many legislators, even as they triumph, because they see the failures of their measures. The powers that be, he said, have, quote, battle diarrhea, end quote, their hearts fail them for fear. 
Our recourse in such a time as this must be to the true chambers of power, to the power of God's Word and Spirit. It is our Lord Himself who declares as He prays, quote, Sanctify them through Thy truth, Thy Word is truth. As Thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify Myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. John 17, 17 to 19. Our Lord states that victory requires complete consecration. The word sanctify can be rendered also as consecrate or hallow. Every power, ability and means must be rendered to God and his kingdom. As Westcott noted, quote, It is not enough for the Christian to be kept, verses 11 and 15. He must also advance, end quote. Moreover, quote, The truth is not only a power within him by which he is moved, it is an atmosphere in which he lives. The end of the truth is not wisdom, which is partial, but holiness, which is universal. End quote. This universal holiness is the bringing of every area of life and thought into captivity to Christ as Lord, as King of all creation. While truth carries with it grace, it does not mean compromise. The early church was not weakened, but rather strengthened by doctrinal controversies. It knew that union is not necessarily unity, a fact that the ecumenical movement today disregards. Dogmatism in our times has a bad meaning. The dictionary defines it as, quote, 1. Positive or arrogant assertion, as of belief, without proof. 2. Phylos, an uncritical faith in the presumptions of reason or a priori principles. End quote. The root word dogma is, we are usually told, a Greek word meaning opinion. In reality, it commonly meant an authoritative decree or ordinance. It is in this sense that we are to understand Christian dogma and dogmatics, of which Gerald Bray has written, quote, Properly understood in this way, Christian dogmatism is the greatest force for freedom which mankind has ever known. By claiming the mind for God, dogmatism shatters the bounds of the natural world which imprison the creative imagination and distort scientific analysis. It makes a relapse into sentimentality and vagueness in the name of religion impossible. It attacks the philosophies of the world and denies the claims of atheistic and amoral logic to rule the lives of men. Dogmatism abhors indifference and agnosticism and demands considered commitments from those who would follow Christ. End quote. We are the people of light, and we are not permitted by our Lord to keep our light under a bushel basket. Matthew 5.15 The chambers of power for us are the places appointed to us by the Lord, to exercise dominion where we are in terms of the image of God in us, in knowledge, righteousness or justice, and with holiness. Genesis 1, 27 and 28, Colossians 3, 1, Ephesians 4, 25. We have too long imagined that the chambers of power are outside of Christ and in the possession of the world. Men's chambers of power are all towers of people, excellent guarantees of confusion and judgment rather than of true dominion. When men believe in man, they will look to man for answers, whereas when men believe in God, they will know that his Son and Word provide us with the answers and the power. As Rome advanced in its humanism, it also progressed, as had Greece, in its recourse to magic and other like answers. The solutions had to come from the natural world Gerhard Ulhern described the lengths to which they went. Quote, Women and children were cut open alive in the palace of Diocletian's co-regent in order to inspect their entrails. Numerous amulets were worn to protect from magic. Omens and signs were diligently observed. Of almost every emperor, portents which predicted his reigning are narrated by his contemporaries. In the life of Diocletian, one of the most important events was the prophecy of a druidess who foretold that he would be emperor when he was only a subaltern in the army near Lutetia, Paris. 
Maximinus Daza never made any change without an omen. He did not even go out without consulting his Chaldean Book of Hours. The interpretation of dreams was pursued with a special zeal. Artemidorus of Ephesus spent his whole life in investigating all that had been written on dreams and even took long journeys to collect experiences and materials. The result was his book on Aerocritica, The Interpretation of Dreams. In it, dreams are divided with the semblance of science into definite classes and then their meaning is given. If one has a dream of a great head, that signifies riches and honours to such as have them not. Otherwise, it pretends care. Long and smooth hair signifies happiness, short hair, misfortune, wool instead of hair, sickness, a short head, misery. If a man dreams that ants creep into his ear, that signifies many hearers to an orator, but death to other men, for ants come out of the earth. End quote. This was the science of the Roman world, and our contemporary scientific mythology, whether in psychiatry or biology, is often equally absurd. The religion of Rome was the imperial cult. The emperors were the lords of the chambers of power and hence were worshipped as gods. A statue of Caesar bore the inscription To the unconquered god, both rich and poor saw divinity in the status chambers of power. But it was men like Paul, beaten in prison and facing death often, quote, of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes to of one, thrice was I beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeying often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. 2 Corinthians 11, 24-28 It was men like Paul who held the true chambers of power and who triumphed. Our Lord is the same Lord as Paul's. We have now the complete revelation the whole word of God. We have the self-same Spirit of God, the Spirit of power. We have a mandate to bring all things into captivity to Christ. Where will we seek power? In the false chambers or in Christ? <laughs>